Welcome to the best club in the universe. Today we have an invocation by Eric. Yes, please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we come before you offering our thanks for bringing us together safely. Sometimes it's easy to forget that our, our how safe, sorry, to forget that our safe arrival and departure is a grace from you. As we prepare for this meeting, we ask that you would be with us. May our thoughts lead to you and our conversations be inspired by you. Help us to put our own agendas to the side and seek your will and outcome for this meeting. Please grant us wisdom in times of uncertainty and clarity in times of confusion. Lead us to solutions and help us to strengthen this group. In Jesus' name, amen. And Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And the four-way test. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? And we have a song by Keith. Well, by the group, by the group. We haven't done God Bless America for a long time. I think we uh, uh, owe it to our country to sing God Bless America. God bless America. Do we have any visitors, visiting Rotarians? Or visitors, I guess. Sorry, I'm new at this. Do we have any visiting Rotarians? We do. We have our finance director, Kelly Conkin, joining us today. Welcome. And Chris? So today I brought uh, Dr. Ruger Stuffelbeam. He's our first year resident from the University of Washington, graduated in June. So. He's building a lot of our clinical programs that we're helping to roll out in the county, and we're hoping to be able to keep him after this year. Welcome. And any other visitors? Did I miss anyone? All right. So club business, salmon barbecue is tonight. And I noticed that Christine did not put times in her emails. I'm assuming that it's like usual five to six social, six o'clock dinner. Anyone know differently? Is that right? Okay, so uh, the Rotary Golf Tournament was last week. Congratulations to Eric Johnson and Bob Stiles for winning this year. Chad Paulson won the KP. I'm not quite sure what that stands for. And Joe Jones had the longest drive of the day. So congratulations to the winners. Too bad to the losers. Okay, service project opportunity um, with Helping Hands Food Bank. They are looking for Rotary members um, to volunteer at their event on Saturday, September 30th. Uh, please see Becky Scrindy for more information. She's right back there. If you don't know Becky, she's raising her hand. She's waving frantically. She really wants some volunteers. Let's see, next week we'll celebrate September anniversaries and the newly renovated Memorial Park. And Mayor Johnson has also invited the club to take part in the ribbon cutting during our meeting. Steve Huggins will also present the budget to the club next week. Now, are there any other club announcements or club business to come to the floor? Gosh, I like this, making it easy. Okay, let's do a raffle. Fifty-five. 
Thank you. Winner pays two dollars. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Number twenty one. Twenty one. Taking the wine, nice. We're gonna raffle that off. Uh, number 19. We will. I might buy it, so that's why I was like, no. Or you can tell us what's in it. Are we doing any more, just the three? That's right. So, would you like to talk about what you brought here, Carl? Okay, so this is grown with the finest manure in the county. All right. We got kale, all you can eat. I got these sweet little tomatoes, some red peppers that are really sweet and tasty. I've got pears that are just perfectly ripe. And you can't have a garden basket without zucchini. So I got some of them. And I got a beautiful cucumber or two in here. And the best carrots you've ever had, right there. So we're gonna raffle this or auction it off. So who'd like to, yes, we're gonna make money off you. $10, we're gonna start with $10. All right, 15. Chris over there has got 15. I saw your hand go up. <laughs> Yeah. Anybody else? 20 bucks? 20? Gina? Anybody? 25? Best manure in the county. This will make you like, you'll never have to go to the doctor again, I promise. Going once, going twice, sold. $20? All right, let's do Sergeant at Arms. Dr. Mickelson. All right. Thank you, Ruth. Um, school just started. This is week two for us. So it might be fun to do uh, school district theme questions for today. And don't worry, these questions are very easy. We should be able to ace all of these. Let's start with this table. Raise your hand if you are an alumni. Okay. If you're, if yes, Cedar Woolley School District. Okay. If your hand's not raised, $2. <laughs> we love our alumni. Okay, this table. Raise your hand if you have a child or grandchild who is in kindergarten in the district starting their K-12 educational career. Yes, this year. Okay, $2. <laughs> Okay, this table, raise your hand if you have attended a, a sporting event in our district and bought, from the, uh, bought a treat from the concession stand to support our seniors. Okay, Mark, $2. <laughs> okay, this one, so let's see. Raise your hand if you are retired from the school district. <laughs> If you're not retired from the school district, $2. So, Phil, you get a pass, actually. <laughs> yes. And the bonus question, this table. Um, if you get this correctly, then you get a pass. You don't pay. Okay, so our district has a theme that I think really embodies what this community is all about. We take care of each other. We support each other. What is our school district's theme? It has been our theme for the past two years. Now, don't look at my bracelet. For call a friend. <laughs> you know, Frank, you get the newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, a dollar, a dollar, because there was a little bit of help. All right, thank you so much. Happy so Mar Miriam, 
Do you have a question for the people online? Oh, yes, question. They like to participate too. Oh, that, that's right, okay. Um, okay, if you have a family member who works in the district, raise your hand, I cannot see. If you don't have a family member who works in the district, that's $2. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. And do we have happy bucks? Happy bucks. Um, I have a happy 10. Today I went out with uh, Monique Brigham, our executive director for the chamber, Sigewilly Chamber, and we handed out anniversary plaques. And a 10 year plaque went to Shelly Shack, a 85 year old. 85 anniversary plaque went to Sijuali Auto Parts and um, Cascade Fabrics came in right behind them at 45 years. And tonight I'm gonna go out to the barbecue. Um, so I'll, I may or may not be at the barbecue for Rotary. Is there a penalty for that? I'll pay up if I need to. Um, but I am helping them celebrate 30 years. So um, congratulations to all those individuals who've been here that long. Got a happy 10. We went out and bought uh, the grandson a bicycle on Sunday and he whined all the way out the door saying it's gonna take so long for him to ride, learn how to ride that bicycle with no training wheels. He rode it in the parking lot as we were going out to the car, then got home, rode it at home and took him out for uh, about a three mile walk yesterday and he rode all circles around us the entire time. Just made me happy as a clam watching him. He hunkers down with his little Spider-Man helmet pulled down, sucker stuck out of his mouth and rides like there's something chasing him and just wondered why Papa and his aunt weren't running behind him to keep up with him. I'd die. Well, this is $20. I was hoping Dave Bricka would be here today because he jarred this memory in my mind and I completely you know hit it forever um, but 50 years ago last week I it was the we were the first ninth grade class to come to the high school and uh, I didn't know anybody and Dave Bricka said I need a locker partner and you know our moms are friends so we're going to be friends and Anyhow, he was my locker partner, and I completely had forgot about that until Dave said that. So anyhow, sometimes it's good to jar your brain and remember things, and it was a great freshman year. Uh, I've got a happy 25 just for to be here this week, uh, coaching soccer with, um, sorry, I just lost oh, my friend Curtis. Uh, so that's fun. Uh, it tests our patience quite a bit, but uh, it's a great time. Happy to have Ruger with us. And my wife and I are expecting our fourth child, a little girl, any day now. So. Anybody else? Okay, I have a happy 20. Um, we won last Friday, Tom football game, 49 to three. We play Sea Home this Friday, home, and then we host Linden home the following, next Friday. And so we've got three jam-packed um, games right on the schedule, which is really fun. And our spirit section was just adorable. They were um, represented Cedar Valley High School with a lot of honor and, and so very excited for our second week of school to finish out. And then next week, I'm going to bring C our new CTE director, but we've hired three excellent uh, teachers in our CTE program, and they're doing phenomenal. We have two ag teachers and a welding teacher, and Dan Goss, many of you might know, uh, he coaches baseball, and so he's our welding teacher. So we're really excited for those three hires. Thank you. That it? Anybody else? Since we're talking about the school, I'll give five bucks, and so will 
Les Huggins, because talking about the first and last, we were the first class, or excuse me, the last class to be uh, freshmen in the high school before the junior high was built. The next class went um, to the junior high at, at the ninth grade. All right, thank you. You know, Chris speaking, um, it reminded me, my husband went to get his flu shot with Hunter this week. And while he was at Schaffner, he saw a older gentleman leaving the building with a, a walker and he was, you know, kind of struggling with his mobility. And he saw Chris run out and he said, hey, can I, help you, your shoes untied. And he was so impressed because Chris noticed that and he got down and tied this gentleman, he's probably in his eighties, he tied a shoe for him. And to me, that speaks to the quality and caliber of the people in this club because Chris doesn't probably know who my husband is. He didn't know he was being observed and watched by someone that would come home and tell me. And to me, that was really special to hear because that's the sort of Rotarian that's that's the, will it build goodwill and better friendships? Absolutely. And that's, it was great to hear that. So. So I'm not sure if someone is introducing our program today or if you want me to introduce, but if early leavers would like to make their quiet exodus, you're more than welcome to do so. And if no one is going to introduce them, I don't know that they actually need a lot of introduction. Today, we're going to have our mayor, Julia Johnson, our city administrator, Charlie Bush, our fire chief, Frank Wagner, and our finance director, Kelly Conkin, talk about the city. I don't know what about, so it'll be a surprise. Thank you all. Um, I'm actually going to do just a little bit of an introduction here. I'm gonna introduce our chief and talk a little bit about, give you background as to why we're here. So it was Benjamin Franklin who once penned, without growth and progress, such words as improvement, achievement, and success have no meaning. For those of you who may not know our fire chief, Frank Wagner. He has been with the Sea Julie Fire Department since 1995. In August of 2000, Frank was promoted to the rank of Lieutenant within the fire department. Of April of 2014, he was actually promoted to the ranks of Captain, and I believe that was within the, is that the volunteer? Or, yeah, within the volunteer. I should know these things, shouldn't I? And in September of 17, Frank was hired full-time as our assistant chief of operations. And then in 19, he became our fire chief. Chief Wagner has always displayed excellent leadership qualities from the time, many years ago, when he came on as a volunteer firefighter. He quickly gained the respect and loyalty of all firefighters and fellow um, officers. Um, it was apparent that Frank was a man who led our fire department quite well and um, he had excellent leadership qualities. Um, and when Chief uh, Dean Klinger decided after 40 some years that he was going to be stepping down with his blessing, and it was my honor to actually bring um, Frank Wagner on as our fire chief. So what does that all mean? Why are we here? Well, it actually kind of goes back to what happened in December 31st of 2018. So after months of collaboration, the city of Cedar Woolley Fire Department um, started providing advanced life support services. And this was a, um, a ILA, it was an interlocal agreement that the cities and the county all came together and we decided to um, basically um, share the money that was coming in from the county and to improve and expand our service and quality of service. Um, we brought on um, new paramedics. So we assimilated our 36 volunteers, our 12 resident firefighters and our 16 um, part-time staff. 
and we provided 24 hour coverage for all 911 calls. This new service um, level has been a great success for the citizens of Cedar Woolley and our surrounding area, providing additional ambulance service and improving response times. While this has been an amazing venture with great dividends, it has also increased the call volume of our first responders. So if I may give you an example, in 2014, right before I came on uh, city council, um, that year we had a total of um, 1,931 calls. Just four years later in 2018, when I came on as mayor, that had gone up 31% to 2528 calls. Four years later, from 18 to 22, it went up to 3635, so 3,635 calls. That's almost an increase of 44%. So a lot of calls that have happened. The move from, um, from successful fire-based fire and full-time fire EMS department, although it has proved to be a good transition, allowing our highly efficient residential firefighters and part-time staff and paramedics to provide the same high quality service to Cedar Woolley and surrounding community. It has also shown that we have grown. We have grown. And I share this because it is a cause of, I don't wanna say concern, but we all need to be fully aware of what is going on. In order to maintain the same highly efficient service, we are asking the community to help provide that service. And with that, I'm gonna have Chief Wagner come and share more. And in the words of Benjamin Franklin, please keep in mind that, you know, without this growth and without the support of you, there cannot be the improvement, the achievement and the success that I know we all deserve and have come to expect. So I'm gonna let you step forward, Frank, and share what it is that we are asking. Well, I thank you, Mayor, uh, and uh, I appreciate the kind words, but everything that we have is probably more based on Chief Klinger and everything he set before us than anything that I've ever done. Uh, I'm just trying to fill the footsteps with probably a size 15 and having a size two foot. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I've almost been here 30 years and uh, uh, kind of like uh, Rotary, the, the foundation that we stand upon with the our fire department is the great folks and the volunteers that have made up those positions. And, and like you'll see with some of these slides coming up, we've, we've normally had between 35 and 50 folks all the years. Uh, the, the downfall is the fact that our call volume continues to climb uh, rapidly throughout the years, uh, more so now that we're doing the transport uh, services here in our area and our uh, surrounding areas. Um, but the, the problem being is volunteerism. Uh, you look back, I think, in our history of the 102 years we've already completed, and we're on our 103rd now, we started out with uh, probably a lot of the same folks that were our, our founders of the city. If you look back at our initial members in 1921, they were the Rotarian types. They were the, the city uh, business owners. We had a whistle downtown on top of the station when I moved in, in in the early 90s that every call went off, that siren went off, and that's what brought the folks from downtown businesses uh, that they'd close up shops and come and jump on a fire engine. They would come from home. Um, and back at that point, we had such a small call volume that every day at noon, we would set off that whistle to show everybody it was lunchtime. One, to, for those folks that wanted to close up shop and go down and have lunch at Joy's Bakery or whatever during the day, that was kind of their, their telltale to know that it was lunchtime. And two, to test out the siren that it actually worked because Otherwise, if we went five or six days without a call, we start questioning, is it, is it working? Do we, do we have a call? Well, now we have all the technology in the world from pagers and, and we have it on our cell phones. As you'll hear sometimes mine will blare off accidentally in, a, in the middle of a, a call. But, but uh, now we're averaging 12 calls a day. Sometimes those 12 calls will be 20, 25 calls a day. And these volunteers are stepping up and doing so much um, uh, for, for so little, kind of like uh, talking about what Chris did with that uh, individual Ruth was talking about, uh, the amount of things they do when people aren't looking. So 3,635 calls last year. Uh, these folks are missing, you know, Easter dinners, they're missing the Super Bowl, they're, 
uh, getting up in the middle of the night on top of their 40, 50, 60 hour work weeks. And it's getting harder and harder to recruit and retain these folks to be volunteers because as you can see, we go out here on Cook Road in the mornings between about 4.30 in the morning and nine, we have so many people that are taking advantage of our amazing city, our parks, our schools, the safety of this community. And they're, they're giving up that themselves by driving down to Seattle and Everett and working for some of these big corporations to allow their families to have that. So when they come home for their eight or 10 hour shifts and put a two hour commute on both sides of that, it's harder to get those folks involved in the volunteer here locally, what we used to be able to rely on. And we've, uh, we, Chief Klinger, had such an amazing program where we have the two stations, one down here at the City Hall, and we have one up here on North Township. Uh, the North Township one was obviously, uh, I don't know if you all know, we paid for that with grant money uh, through uh, FEMA and AFG grants. Um, and we, we have apartments in those buildings. So where I started in the fire service, right out of high school, I graduated in 93, moved right into the fire department shortly thereafter. You have your own little apartment, you were able to go to college, have a daytime job, and you just did coverage at nights and weekends. And uh, we always joked that we were kind of the farm team where we don't have the, the sales tax, the, the property tax, the resources to pay, you know, 100, 150, $200,000 a year like the Everett's, the Seattle's, but we had community. We had uh, a spot for these folks to learn. And we'd bring folks in like myself, uh, like Paul, uh, probably some of your friends and family um, that have been through this program. And, and most of the time they would be with us three, four, five, six years. Um, they get the certifications through the state. They get their emergency medical technician uh, credentials. And then they can start testing at these bigger departments for a career. And we had not only the benefit of, of kind of working through them and getting those resources and having those folks to rely on each and every night, but a lot of them would then go to work in these places and then buy a house in the community here. So they would go off to work in Bellingham or Seattle, or, you know, we have folks in uh, uh, Portland. We have, we have folks all over the nation throughout the, the years I've been here. Uh, and, but a lot of them that would work in this region would live here and just commute because they only work seven or eight days a month. So it's, it was kind of a win-win for everybody, but the climate of, of staffing wasn't where we started uh, seeing in 2018, 2019, where we would have some amazing folks. It would take them 7, 10, 15 testing processes to get hired. Now we have such a huge demand in this region for, for firefighters that were, I think the first time I ever tested was with Seattle Fire. There was almost 5,000 people for a testing process they weren't even sure they were going to hire for. Well, now you're lucky. Um, uh, I think uh, Anna Cordes, Burlington, Malvernon, and ourselves have been, had hiring processes where we had less than 10 folks even apply. And of those folks, when you go to give offers, some folks are already accepting offers elsewhere. Uh, so it's really hard. And, and uh, a lot of our new kids, they come in, I call them kids, they're not actually kids, but uh, they come in and as soon as they get their certs, they're out the door sometimes before their even year probation is up. So uh, it, it's, it's a, a buyer's market, I guess you would say. Uh, but our, our call volume is increasing. Uh, our volunteers are coming down. Um, we, we went from having those one call a day, two calls a day on a, on a busy day to now we're double digits pretty much every day. Uh, our record I think is 27 in, in one 24 hour period. But with that, we're also having calls where 43% of the time this year right now, if we have one call, we're going to have a second overlapping call at the same exact time. And why we, we try to, uh, we have interlocal agreements with a lot of our surrounding agencies like Burlington and District 8 and, and Mount Vernon, uh, where if we have a call and they have the resources, they'll send someone over. That's when you, when you have a second, a third, uh, like I was telling Charlie uh, uh, on Monday, we had four calls at the same time one being a fire in a building, one being a, a broken sprinkler alarm that was flooding uh, rooms at one of our local hotels and two aid calls at the same time. Well, when you have those labor intensive jobs going on all at the same time, you may not have the resources to draw in from those other agencies because they have their own call volume and, and uh, responsibilities to handle as well. So graciously, as we're up here talking, our uh, uh, city council over the last couple of years, our public safety committee has been looking at what can we do? And 
the, our, our city council has uh, allowed us to put forth on the ballot coming up a uh, levy lid lift. So with that, Charlie's gonna speak more to that here in a minute uh, on what that means to us. Um, we are, are actively recruiting volunteers as we speak. Uh, we have three new kids in the academy right now. Uh, they're doing a phenomenal job, but the problem is, is we've lost 19 to full-time jobs here in the last 20 months. Uh, so when we're, we went in the mid to, uh, uh, mid, mid to late 90s and early 2000s, we would lose maybe one, maybe two every couple of years to a full-time job. Now we're losing you know, double digits in, in one individual year of these folks. So we put the time, the resources, and the money into getting them up and trained. We have such a great uh, bench strength as far as teaching these folks and giving them the tools and the, the credentials and the experience with the call volume that we have. Uh, we actually have chiefs out there that are actually coming in and going, who's next? We, we, we want your folks because not only do they have the fire credentials, they have the, the experience now working on these ambulances and 80% of our calls now are medical. Um, and so uh, these new kids, they come through, they know how to transport. They know they're great EMTs. They're working us alongside of paramedics. They have those interactions with our emergency rooms and hospitals and, and, uh, it, uh, where we used to be kind of like an internship program where we were kind of proud of that. Now it's, it's kind of hindering our, our retention, but on a good level, we just don't have the funds to keep them here. And with this levy lid lift, we're, we're looking at adding eight new uh, firefighters, uh, EMTs to our roster if it goes through. Uh, we're, we're not looking at getting rid of volunteers at all. That's the backbone of what we have and what our program is. And we're trying to recruit and get more. Uh, we'd like to have uh, right now we're at 27 volunteers, I believe, as of today. We'd like to be back above 40. Um, but uh, it's, it's trying to, like in every aspect, you, you put out a list of people to volunteer, it's harder and harder to fill with the responsibilities and things that people are doing and, and, and the commitments that they have on every level. Um, here's a, kind of a graph of where we were in 2014. Uh, where we are right uh, this last uh, year in 2022. Obviously the graphs, we took a major hit uh, when we got to COVID. Uh, a lot of your left two firefighters in our region uh, where they can retire at 53 in the past, a lot of them would not retire at 53 because they love their job. So they would stay around for you know eight, nine more years and, and wait until their 60s. And, and now we saw a mass uh, retirement happening in the middle of COVID because some of these folks where they were able to retire and normally wouldn't said, We're, we don't want to deal with the, everything that's going on. So uh, a lot of these departments, they would hire the bigger departments, they would hire maybe five or 10 folks a year. They're hiring 40 or 50 at a time uh, with these rural fire, th or regional fire authorities like in South County, uh, Vancouver, Spokane, Seattle. Um, it, it's, it's a great opportunity for some of these folks that uh, we put through and they're very appreciative and we're hoping that some of them will come back and Hopefully, if we get this levy lid lift, we can maybe draw some of those fact, folks back to this great community. But time, time will tell. Um, it's a, a, a battle that uh, I think we're, we as a whole in the volunteer world are going to continue to have. Uh, there was a big uh, news uh, uh, deal on King 5 the other night. And uh, was it 19? Well, 20 years ago, they had, uh, had 23,000 volunteers in the state of Washington that were volunteer firefighters. This last year, we're down to around 10. So we've lost almost 60% of our entire volunteer uh, community in the, in the fire service. And that was never the case. When, when I started in the early 90s, we had a hiring list where we'd have 20 or 30 people on that list. And we could only, you know, only had budgeted to, to maybe do eight uh, people into an academy at a time. We were being able to be selective and we were able to uh, hold people back and say, next time, next time. Now, if we get two or three people uh, sign up, it's a good, good testing process. And where we used to only hire once a year, now we're doing quarterly. Uh, and we're, we're recruiting folks that already have their credentials uh, uh, around the clock. So if, if we can find a part-timer or somebody that's willing to come in and, and uh, work with, uh, with us, we're able to work with them. We're offering tuition reimbursement for some of our residents where they can come in, have a free apartment, well, free, uh, but learn learn the trade, uh, uh, 
uh, work with us four or five nights a week, go on a lot of calls and go to college and get us, uh, have us help pay for their tuition. So we're trying to think outside of the box to, to draw those folks in and appreciate the amazing folks we have. And like right now, I, I my uh, uh, officer staff, I've got, uh, you know, Troy Hansen, he's working at Skagit Aggregates, probably 40, 50, 60 hours a, a week with uh, Mr. Dahl. He says more than that. Uh, uh, we got Ariel Wesson is a captain with us. She has a full-time job with the police department. She's uh, sergeants of uh, 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 records. Uh, Gerald Chandler has been with us. Uh, this is his 40th year. He's uh, one of the big wigs with uh, uh, one of our major uh, uh, Nelson Petroleum uh, out of uh, Arlington down there. So amazing people that are putting uh, probably there's you, you I mean, realistically, they're putting their family second sometimes because of the things they're giving up to provide services for our community. And we want to continue to appreciate them and, and draw many more of those folks in if we can. But we're at a point now where we, we need to subsidize the volunteers with some, some more folks. Um, and my call volume continues to go up. Our needs are going to continue to go up. And this is kind of what we're looking at to try to, to uh, meet those crossroads to, to provide the services what everybody's used to and uh, continue that down uh, the road in the future. So with this proposition that's going to come on the, the ballot, it'll come out to your mailboxes October 18th. This is what we're looking for is eight additional firefighter EMTs to help reduce the response times and restore levels of service. This week alone, uh, we have browned out station two, three out of the five days this week, uh, which is something you know, five years ago, we never would have ever thought of. Um, but uh, when you don't have the staff, it's, it's, it gets harder and harder. Um, this is Charlie. After the chief, I have very little to say, but this is the cost of the levy itself, uh, $27.22 a month for those additional eight firefighter EMTs. You may ask, why can't the city just find that in the budget? Uh, we have a very very tight general fund. We fund police and fire out of it. We fund parks. We fund some of the streets. We fund a lot of the staff you see at City Hall. Um, and, and we're stretched pretty thin. There's eight firefighters is a large, large expense. This is really a shift in our model uh, for delivering fire service to more full-time employees from the volunteer model. And it's due to this change in circumstances. And there are a bunch of macro elements that have really played on this. The chief mentioned a bunch of them. Um, and then our, our call volume has gone up as well. So it's, it's a perfect storm of sorts for us. We knew that this day would come at some point where we'd need to have this conversation with the community. And uh, given this has been going on for the two years I've been here, and it's been a year of conversation with the council to get to this point, uh, we're definitely there. We're at that point to check in with the community and see if the community wants to shift our model in a different direction. If we don't do that, we're stuck with browning out fire stations and, and response time that is not at the same level that it used to be. So that's where we find ourselves and uh, happy to take any questions. We got a whole team here. Kelly's here as well to, to answer anything related to the, the deep finances of the city. Yes. What, what's the role of the eight firefighters? Is it going to be two on a 24 hour shift or is that? Yeah, it'll be uh, uh, eight additional uh, folks that will go to the bargaining unit, which will be two for every day. So we're on a, a four platoon system. So this will allow us to staff one extra rig every single day. So not to take away, we're gonna continue uh, providing services, hopefully with the volunteers and part-timers we have on the other uh, four positions that are scheduled every day. This will increase us to having eight on every day. That makes sense. So that's uh, 27, 22 a month more. What are we paying as a base now? And there's your cue. Here comes Kelly with the spreadsheets. So right now, uh, the levy rate is $1.80 per thousand dollars for Cedar Woolley's portion of the levy. That would go up about 82 cents. So for the average, again, for the average household, it would be about $27.22 a month. That's what it is. 
Um, I don't have the number per month, but I have one um, copy of an average home. So um, it's about $800 a year. Yes. Is the increase in call volume proportional to the, just the increase in population in the area? Is there another factor at play? I honestly uh, uh, think that, that the population has definitely been a part of this. Uh, for us individually, I mean, the entire county has got a 17% increase across the board for everybody. And we're right in line with that. We had a huge spike there in 2019 when we assumed the uh, ALS transition. And like uh, the mayor uh, kind of hit on there a little bit, we were, it was brought to all of the, the cities in, let's say, August or September of that year before. And I think consultants over 20 years had been saying we needed to go fire based with our EMS services. We had EMS levy that had uh, the paramedic services out of, uh, whether it was affiliated, Skagit, or uh, Skagit County EMS as, as a whole. And they said, uh, out of efficiency, we needed to go to fire base. They talked about that for 20 years. And then in 2018, in about, let's say four or five months, it was just a steamroll deal. And we went from thinking it was never gonna happen to all the cities we had a chance at that time to either step up or be left behind. The train was kind of leaving. And at that point, a lot of folks got in the room and said, do we wanna do this? Do we wanna be in a model where we never have a, a say anymore? And one individual entity maybe in the county is gonna run it all? Or do we all want to kind of have our own little say and, and have a, a piece of, uh, be a part of the solution, I guess you would say. So at that point, uh, all the entities worked together. We uh, uh, took on their call volume. So where we're, we would normally respond just to the city of Cedar Woolley in our outlying areas with Fire District 8, we now see an ambulance go to concrete sometimes, uh, to Alger. Now vice versa, when we have all of our rigs out, we'll see an ambulance come from Burlington Fire or from Malvernon. Uh, so that was a huge spike for us that one year, but I think that uh, eight to 15% is an increase that we're seeing not only just with population, but the reliance upon 911 in itself. And we're trying to counteract that with uh, what you're calling the mobile integrated healthcare position. So we're finding that we have some outliers out there in all of our communities in the entire region. Bellingham has been doing a pilot. Anacortes has been doing a pilot to kind of cut our 911 uses. Like when I started in the early 90s, we had to go around door to door passing out stickers, getting people to try to call 911 because 911 was new and no one wanted to use it. And you'd have folks that would be like, uh, I have a little bit of pain, but it'll wear off. Well, then they'd get to the hospital and find out they had had a heart attack and, or a stroke. Or, and now we've got to the point where we've kind of swung the pendulum the other direction where we have folks calling 911 because they have an emergency, but really when we get there and we get them evaluated and we get them transported, they really had anxiety or they have a mental health problem or there's a substance abuse. Uh, so these mobile integrated healthcare positions are trying to minimize the misuse of 911 and get these folks maybe in the point in the direction of getting the resources they need so we can have the ALS and BOS services available for those that truly have emergencies, if that makes sense. Sir. Yeah. Uh, back for the spreadsheet. So we're paying, uh, we want to pay about a hundred bucks a month for the, if this goes through, it'll be about a hundred dollars. This just for fire. And then what happens with police? I understand the police want more policemen and the city sewer wants more sewer. And, and so can you maybe give us a, a shout or a, an, uh, an idea of what is the total cost to live in the city per average house? And what do we get for that? And I'm not trying to grill you. I just wanna make sure that everybody understands the value of this. I'm a water guy. I do public water for, and I understand the value of that. Thank you. Um, so it would be approximately 12 to $1,300 a year for 
the entire your entire property tax bill for Cedra Woolley. Now, Cedra Woolley is only about 20% of your total property tax bill, but with the property tax, uh, we fund our general fund, so police, fire, parks, um, our city hall staff. We also fund um, all of our park staff, the cemetery, our street staff, and um, a small portion of the library. The city owns part of that land. No, your total, so like in this example, this homeowner pays $800 a month this year, or $800 a year for to the city of Cedar Woolley in property tax. That $800 covers all of the general fund. It's not just fire, it's covered all of that. But to, right now our focus is on getting these eight additional fire fighter EMTs which would increase the property tax per home or of the average home um, by over a little over $300 a month. So to get a year, thank you, to get, the, uh, to get all of those services plus the eight additional firefighters, this is the cost. Right now, a couple of years ago, we had a different proposition one for the police department, and now we're focusing our attention on the need in the fire department. Yeah, we also receive um, different revenues for different things. Of course, we also receive a sales tax, which goes into our general fund to help fund some of these items as well. Are, we have utilities, so we have sewer, storm water, and garbage. Those run separately from the general fund. So those bills pay only for those services. I, I just want to add here. So um, we're asking for eight, eight more firefighters. That's what this levy is all about. Plus, it'll, it'll help with um, the equipment, which is badly needed and which has grown exponentially because of supply and demand and also the inflation. What we really need really is 16 firefighters, but the um, council only wanted to go for eight. They had started out at four, which would have not really helped at all, but they bumped it up to eight. So we have eight firefighters that we're asking for. And um, in order to provide really good service, we actually need these eight people. Where, where we're at now, which I think the chief touched on but didn't really share was that he was talking about that we brown out the station up on the hill simply because we don't have the manpower right now and it's a concern because people who are working are burning out and we don't want to see that happen with our staff which is that it's 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 a, it's a, it's not a pleasant story to tell, but that's kind of where we're at and we're not alone. Um, other cities are looking at the same thing. It's just as the chief pointed out, with the retirements that have happened, the volunteers who are no longer in place, it does make it it does make it terribly, terribly hard. And one last piece to this. Um, so the chief and I are actually working with Burlington and we're hoping to put into place what will be community paramedics, which will help deter some of these calls that are non-emergent so that they can actually go to the calls that are emergencies. So um, it, it, it's a very promising plan. Um, I'm 90% sure that it's gonna fall into place. It's just a matter of the grant coming into play and we have to wait, um, I believe it's the end of this month or October to hear about the grant money. So we're doing everything that we can within our power and within our ability and with what's available to continue to supply and support our community with the services that they actually that they deserve, that you absolutely deserve. All right. Thank you all for that great presentation. I've been listening to it on the council meetings over the last year and getting all the information. And I heard 
you say about this need for 16 and the account, I heard the entire discussion about, well, we'll go for four and then, okay, we'll bump it up to eight. So it's, that was a great presentation. I appreciate it. And we'll get you a pin. You deserve it from getting quizzed from Carl. And um, thank you very much. Yeah. Do we have any other announcements or comments from the floor? No? All right, well, Christine left me a joke. So I'm sure you're all excited to hear it. A teenager brings her new boyfriend home to meet her parents. They're absolutely appalled by his haircut, his tattoos, his piercings. Later, the girl's mom says, dear, he doesn't seem to be a very nice boy. Oh, please, mom, says the daughter. If he wasn't nice, would he be doing 500 hours of community service? 